in 100 years' time, if we poll a majority of professional economists, they'll say, most of them, that Charles Darwin was the founder of our discipline, not Adam Smith. Everybody today would say Adam Smith, and, and with good reason. Why would they say Charles Darwin? I think in, in, in time, maybe not 100 years even, in time it will be widely recognized that Darwin's understanding of the competitive process was much more general and much more descriptive of the reality that we actually confront than Smith's was. Smith's theory, the invisible hand theory at any rate, will be seen as an interesting special case of Darwin's theory. Let me give you some examples of what I mean. So uh, Darwin recognized that the competition he studied, uh, the, the struggle for resources among plants and, and animals in nature, was very much like the competition that Smith had studied. People are trying to outdo one another, basically, for the resources needed to survive and prosper. And what he noted was that in many cases, you do get invisible hand-like results in nature. So think about the keen eyesight of the hawk. That's a nice story that parallels, I think, Adam Smith's product design improvement story for the invisible hand. There was a mutation that caused some hawk to see a little bit better, uh, just a random uh, uh, shuffling of the, the proteins, and that hawk caught more prey. It was able to leave more offspring, therefore the mutation spread. Then another mutation came and it spread to those mutations accreted. The ones who had the biggest dose of the mutation gained ground in the population relative to those who had smaller doses of it. Uh, but in the end, all surviving hawks have incredibly keen eyesight. I could post a, a, a page from the LA White Pages on the back wall there and a hawk uh, sitting right here could read you all the numbers off of it if it, if it could speak. Uh, it's no longer individually advantageous to hawks to have keen eyesight. They all have keen eyesight. But hawks as a, as a group do very well because of that fact. Uh, they've been a very prosperous species on account of it. So there's the invisible hand. But it doesn't always work out that way. A nice counterpoint is the narrative that accompanies the, the, the selection of the massive antlers we see in the bull elk. They span four feet, many of them. They're, they weigh 40 pounds. They're massive, they're huge. Why are they so big? Darwin's account began with the observation that uh, bull elk, like males in most vertebrate species, take more than one mate if they can. <laughs> the qualifier is important. Uh, it means that if some succeed at that, others aren't gonna get any mates at all, which is a, a big issue in the Darwinian scheme. If you don't get any mates, then you don't leave your stuff behind. So males take every step at their disposal to try and gain access to females. Of course, it's, it's the whole ball game. And they fight with one another. And in the case of the elk, it turns out that the antlers are their weaponry. If you wanna predict which bull will win a fight, uh, put your money on the one who has the slightly larger rack of antlers. That's why the first mutation was favored, spread quickly. That's why additional mutations started building on that one. And here we are, uh, millennia later, we've got antlers four feet across, 40 pounds. Well, what's the problem? The problem is, if you have that big an appendage on your head and you're chased by a wolf into a densely wooded area, what do you do? You're dead meat. They surround you easily. They, they nip at you. You're, you're, you're killed quite easily. If they could take a vote on the matter, at the count of three, push that button, all antlers will shrink by half. They would have compelling reasons to do that. Uh, they'd, they'd resolve every fight the same way as, as they do now because it's relative antler size, after all that matters, not absolute antler size, and they'd each be less vulnerable to being caught and killed by wolves. Uh, they can't do that. Darwin wasn't much interested in animal efforts to try and resolve that kind of conflict between individual and group interests because he, he saw intuitively, well, what can they do? You know, they can't communicate, they can't organize, they can't collectively uh, take action of any kind. They're stuck, but we're not stuck. Uh, in the marketplace, they're play out countless analogs to that. Uh, I, I think it's important just to, to pause a bit and stress why this is an in, inefficient situation. I, I was excited a few weeks ago when I saw that Slate had posted a review of my book prominently on, on its website. Uh, they had a nice picture of Darwin. And then I saw the subtitle of the re review and my heart sank. It was uh, 
what the Darwin economy gets wrong about evolution. That was the subtitle. <laughs> I thought, oh. Did, did I make a mistake? I, t I showed it to a bunch of biologist friends. They all seemed to like it. You know. So I, I read the review carefully, and uh, it, it was a review. I'll say his name clearly, just so if anybody watches the, <laughs> the, the video. His name was John Whitfield, uh, a science writer, uh, somebody trained in, in thinking about science. So you, we would have expected more from, from someone like this. He said, if big antlers were a problem, natural selection would have long since curbed their size. That's just a fundamental misunderstanding of how the process works. Uh, it's true they don't keep growing forever. They're not 40 feet across. They don't weigh 4,000 pounds. If they did, uh, how effective would that animal be? From age six months on, he would never be able to get his nose up off the turf. You know, he would never win any battles. He would, he would die uh, an early death. So yes, natural selection limits the growth of antlers but not before they've gotten too big from the perspective of bull elks as a group. Yes, your, your GDP uh, capability limits the amount you spend on military armaments if you're in a military arms race. You can't spend more than you earn. But does that mean that the amount you spend is the right amount? Most people think people in, in military arms races, countries embroiled in them spend too much on arms. That's why they sign agreements trying to curb that spending. These are all of a stripe. If we all stand up to see better, is that optimal from the group's point of view? None of us see any better than if we'd all remain comfortably seated. You want to see better? Go ahead, stand up. Then the guy behind you will have to stand up. And then everybody will end up having to stand up. For what? For, for no good purpose. It was Darwin's key insight that when individual and group interests are in conflict, it's individual interests that trump to the detriment of the group. 